from the creators who brought you RuPaul's Drag Race and Million Dollar Listing. This is World of Wonders Wow Report. Things that make us go wow. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Wow Report. I'm so excited to be reunited uh, with Tom Campbell, our Chief Creative Officer. And Hello. Hi. And James St. James, editor of the Wow Report. And I'm Fenton Bailey, co-founder of the World of Wonder. And what we do every week is we count down the top 10 things this week that made us go, wow. So I feel a bit out of it, but um, let's get into the countdown. I've missed you guys so much. I've missed you guys. It's nice to have the original three back together again. Three musketeers. You no, know, Blake is listening. <laughs> <laughs> we three no, kings. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's start with the countdown. Number 10. Number 10. We haven't had a chance to talk about this. We've talked a little bit about space travel when What's-His-Face went up, Mr. Virgin. Jeff Bezos in space. I was just, optics alone were so disgusting. Is what? It, the, we, he's flying a penis into space. How <laughs> is your dream? That's what we've always wanted. <laughs> I think you mean different kind of optics, right, Tom? You're not talking penises. No. <laughs> I love a penis um, <laughs> or two, uh, but just uh, it's, it, I can't help but think that, you know, space travel in this regard is like the new, like luxury, obnoxious nesting yacht. That it's just a show of power, of prestige, of, of how big your dick is. And I, I have to tell you, someone who I normally love depressed me the most in the coverage of this event and it's Gail King, normally on a pedestal for me for so many reasons and good ones, but she was covering this three miles from the site and everyone was trying to uh, compare this to the time that we walked on the moon. And it's like, no, it wasn't that at all. It was like some, you know, billion dollar uh, uh, Six Flags Magic Mountain ride. You know, and there was such reverence in any kind of, there was no news coverage of it on CBS. They actually had some exclusive, they, they could get three miles within the launch site. And it was, it was again, you know, at least they said, well, you know, some people are calling this a folly, but you know, poo on them. It's like, uh, Gail, have you been on David Geffen's billion? This is when you start to realize how billionaires pollute all of our lives. Billionaire Oprah, billionaire Geffen, billionaire. Well, you do maybe get the feeling that Oprah offered her a seat on the next flight, and the two of them are going up. Don't you think that Oprah's uh, on the on the list for the next one? It just feels like a lack, they, they, like a true let them eat cake kind of moment in in modern society. Well, what about that quote that he said when he got back to Earth? He said. I want to thank every Amazon employee and every Amazon customer because you guys paid for all this. That right. is, and, so and they, do, they don't get like living wages, and they they're peeing in bottles at the Amazon factory. Yeah. Like those and poor they're, workers, they're, actually, they're pooping in plastic bags to make their deliveries on time. Yeah, it it is like the king in, in the surfs and and everything. I did see there was a really great quote that um I saw on Twitter that um someone said. Do you think that UFOs are really just billionaires from other planets coming to visit us? <laughs> well, of course, that's the isn't that the story of the man who fell to Earth? The David <laughs> he kind of like falls to Earth and he becomes a billionaire and figures is trying to get back to space. So mm -hmm. Jeff Bezos really just trying to get home. <laughs> and, and you know, he, he didn't really he didn't really advance technology. It's he's done something that was done. 50 years ago, but he just did it himself with the money from em employees. And then he didn't have the, you know, all that was missing was one of those kind of long, you know, those five feet tall cocktail glasses that you get like at Cancun or, or in Vegas. So like I went to space or a t-shirt that says I went to space yeah. and all and I got was this t-shirt. It was like billionaire spring break. And it disgusted really? me and I have to just go on. Uh, I just have to say that. And I'm very disappointed in Gail King. Gail, call me. Let's talk about it. I do just want to reiterate one more time that I think that, you know, at some point space exploration is going to be important in our future. And I think that we ignored it for 50 years and I think it's time to get back into space. And I agree that we need to do other things on this planet and it is a folly, but I. And I'm it's probably going to have to be done privately. Probably. Yeah, it is going to have to be done privately. You're absolutely right. Why? Because, because people don't because, pay taxes. Because billionaires don't pay taxes. 
because it's about their own ego versus like actual I go governance, maybe you know. And I'm sorry, I'll go back and say what I said last time you said that, James, which is let's make Earth habitable, if that's a no, word. No, it's fine, but let's also make Mars habitable. Let's have a choice. Let's let's go to the moon. Let's go to Mars. Let's go to Venus, and let's go to you know uh, Alpha in the billionaires. Romero. In the billionaires. Alpha Romero, that's a card. <laughs> I'm sorry. I suppose Elon yeah. Musk does have a vision and a plan, right? Uh, I mean, I'm not quite sure what Jeff Bezos wants to do in space, but Elon Musk wants to get colonize Mars. So yeah, the, no, I'm fine. Uh, yeah. When I applied to college and I told everybody I wanted to go to business school, I didn't really. You just say that, see, they, they, they let you into college. Oh, I don't I trust them. I don't like them. I don't like the optics. I don't like the reality of it. I don't like, why don't you spend a billion dollars trying to replace plastic bottles on Earth? Well, but, but that's the thing. They've all said that they are going to continue to to do these. I mean, it's not just, it's not an either or situation. It's not a, a, a you know. It was thrill seeking and it was disgusting. Well, okay. Ego filled thrill seeking, in my humble opinion. It's too early in the day to get a reaction out of James. All right. <laughs> <laughs> bitch, 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 bitch. Bitch. What let's stick with the space theme, I guess, as we move on to number nine, right, James? Number nine. If if you no. count Eternia as part of the space theme, I'm talking about He Man, <laughs> Masters of the Universe. Is that what no. you were referring to? That was my not so clever segue. Yes, but I've been shamed. My segue has been shamed. Oh, that's funny. Well, I did watch the Masters of the Universe, the new um, series on Netflix that is written and produced by filmmaker Kevin Smith. So it's got quite a pedigree. And it is um, it is clever and funny. It sort of takes off where the old He-Man cartoons from the 1980s uh, left off. And it has a killer cast. It's got Mark Hamill as Skeletor. And it's got Sarah Michelle Gellar as Tila. And it's got uh, Lena Headey from uh, Game of Thrones, Cersei. And she is Evil Lynn. And uh, if Ke Kevin Smith has talked in interviews about how he is very much aware that He-Man is a queer icon. And he's very much playing into that with this. And one of the things that he does is, you know, Prince Adam and He-Man are the same person. Spoiler alert. And uh, Prince Adam was always just He-Man in a pair of pants and a shirt. And like, then He-Man, but you know, is wearing a loincloth. And that's, it's sort of like Clark Kent and Superman. Like, how can nobody notice that they're the same, not the same person? It's very, you know. What are the, yeah, exactly. But this time, now Prince Adam is this sort of willowy twink. He's very thin and he's very pretty and he's very, just a totally different person. And then when he turns into, um, uh, raises the sword and says, oh, I am the power, he becomes a circuit queen. He becomes a big muscle queen in a loincloth. And that's, it's very much gay. It, you, you can't help but think that uh, the twink who turns into the circuit queen is, is a, you know, a trope here. Um, but the fans are very much up in arms about this. And he thought he was doing this great thing for the fans and bringing He-Man back. But people are furious with him because um, He-Man isn't in. It's, they put out five episodes and He-Man is only in one of them. And he gets killed the first episode. And then it's um, uh, Sarah Michelle Gellar's character trying to bring magic back to Eternia and bring him back from the dead. So he's only in the first episode. And I think what happened was is that they said they needed to pay Sarah Michelle Geller some Sarah Michelle Geller money and they pro probably pitched it to her as yeah it's He-Man but you're going to be the star and so they turned it into the Sarah Michelle Geller hour and people are not happy with that is this animated or live action it's animated yeah it's uh -huh. it's, it's all animated um and uh it's it's really good animation and it's really fantastic and it is fun um and like he, um Lena Headey is is Evil Lynn is hysterical and the scale Mark Hamill I don't know Mark Hamill was one um um Emmys for his uh, Joker voiceovers in Batman the Batman cartoons he's really really good at voiceover and his Skeletor is absolutely hysterical it is worth checking out if you ever got a boner for He Man uh, uh yeah. You I Blake did. raises his hand. Yes, you had a boner for He Man. One of my most traumatic experiences involves He Man and She Ra. I w we were at our condo in Florida when I was about five years old, and my parents wanted to go out to eat, and I wanted to stay home with my friend and watch He Man and She Ra. And I was mad, so I went and got in the elevator, and I got lost in the building. <laughs> I thought oh, I am. <laughs> so you associate he-man with getting lost in the trauma of being lost yes yeah but i still love him 
The only thing I heard from that story is that Blake's family had a condo in Florida. So he, he's another billionaire among us. Well, <laughs> Brittany paid for it. <laughs> <laughs> now, is, is, is it Master, uh, Masters of the Universe uh, Cohen Revelation? And that is streaming on Netflix, I believe, right? Give it a shot. Yes, give it a whirl. Is, I, I'm sorry, I should know this. Is Kevin Smith gay? No, no, he's uh -huh. a big comic book nerd, is what but he he's is. gay friendly. Or gay yeah, just, yeah, so. he's 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 very much a nerd, and he's nerd uh, uh, knows what the nerd gay nerds like. I got it. Okay, all right. Going to move on to number eight. Number eight. I'm going to stick with the space theme. <laughs> Tangentially, 2040. Uh, basically, look, the end is nigh. Agreed. Right. Yeah, in sure. 1972, uh, MIT put out a study called uh, The Limits to Growth. And it was actually became a big, big bestseller. And it basically said that civilization would collapse in 2030, 2040. And they did all this sort of data projection stuff based on population, resources, pollution. And it sat around for years. And when it came out, I think it was discredited. A lot of people said, no, 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 you know, this is ridiculous. We'll find technological solutions. There is no limit to growth. And this woman, Gaya Harrington, um, kind of stumbled upon this study and decided to see now how it held up, you know, whether the, all the projections that they made in 1972 were still on target. And the, the, the headline revelation is, Yes, they are. And the world is going to end in 1970. So we got to get the hell out to Mars. Get off of the planet. Well, she says, you know, the basic, here's the basic problem. The idea of limitless growth is not sustainable. That's where she's coming from. And it's timely, isn't it? Because, you know, with the COVID pandemic, so much of business is about getting back to normal. And she's saying, guys, you can't get back to normal. There has to be another way because she's saying that we're not all going to die necessarily but we do have to change up we have to turn back oh man for swear thy foolish ways well fenton this is what i was talking to you about the other day on the phone when i was saying it's a you know this idea of going back to all the things that that mm. that got us in trouble in the first place the idea that we were going back to concerts and in in nightclubs and all this stuff that's what got us into trouble it's a bit like if there had been a vaccine in 1982 for aids and then everyone rushes back to the bathhouse and gets railed by a hundred men like i mean you don't do that type of thing we can't go back to the same way we were living before covid there's just it's it, it's foolish and it's going to get us by the time we get to the lambda variant and the omega variant and all this stuff it is going to be a, a, a walking dead right well, so you're with her on this, right? I'm totally with her. In fact, I have an, an article I want to give to you, Fenton, um, from a guy named Andrew Tanner, who uh, basically said that um, the it's all going, the world is going to end very soon because it's inevitable that Trump is going to be reelected in 2024, that the Republicans take back the House and the and the and, and Congress and and everything, and um, that that will set off the chain of events that leads to the um the civil war in which the united states breaks up at which point um uh russia or somebody somebody it, it starts uh, it starts the chain reaction I in see. which we divide oh, up yeah, the, give me that article i love a doomy yeah, read there's, there's no way right. to, to stop with this this domino effect that's happening and once the united states breaks up that's when the enemies can come in and start the world war that will destroy the planet boom should we just stop the countdown right now and just, I don't know, <laughs> go to sleep or bear, dig, or dig a hole or something? <laughs> well, I time. want to read this MIT, this MIT yeah, thing. Well, and I'm if, if you wanted to buy the original, you know, it was published in 1972. I, I was on Amazon, speaking of. I was on Amazon looking for a copy. <laughs> it will cost you $999 to buy a copy. But the good news is there was an update um, and there's a Kindle version. So... I bought it. I haven't read it yet, but I am kind of interested to read it. Well, um, I'm sort of interested. Do you remember Future Shock that came out in the yes. 70s? Oh, I love Future Shock. It, it, does yeah. that hold up? Is is did all of that come to pass? Well, no, I think Alvin Toffler was completely right. His whole idea was that after generations and centuries of stability and very slow innovation, his argument was that the pace of innovation would increase and increase and increase. And that that was the idea of Future Shock, that it is continual, ever increasingly rapid change. 
And it's I true. think that that has grown out to be true. You yeah. know, and it, and 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 the faster you go, it's like circling the drain, and you get closer and closer to to the edge of of the abyss. Yes. Well, there you go. That's a cherry thing. So uh, you, this is what happens when you wake me up at three in the morning to do a, a radio show. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's take a quick break. Um, before the world ends, you might want to check out Drag Race Holland Season 2. Uh, the queens have been revealed, and uh, it's going to premiere on Wow Presents Plus uh, August 6th. So hopefully that will come out before the end of the world. Blake, do you have a question for us? Of course I do. Um, we're in the middle of the 2020 Tokyo Olympics, so I have a couple of Olympic questions. What are the colors of the Olympic rings and what do they represent? We'll have the answer right after the break. You're listening to the Wow Report on Radio Andy. You're listening to World of Wonders Wow Report. Things that make us go wow. And welcome back. I'm Fenton here with uh, Tom Campbell and James St. James. Um, we're in a very doomy frame of mind today <laughs> as we count down the final countdown. You remember that song? All right, Blake, what was the question? Um, we're in the middle of the 2020 Tokyo Olympics, so I'm asking Olympic questions. What colors are the Olympic rings, and what do they represent? Well, we got red, we got yellow, we got black, green, green, green and black. Blue. Yeah, a blue. That's it. Blue, yellow, black, green, and red. Oh, there are five of them. Oh, there's black? There's a black ring? Yes. Yeah, they are. Yeah. What do you think they represent, Tom? Um, they represent all of the communities of the world. Well, I don't know about that. I don't think we can say that anymore. Are they like, the basic colors, the primary? They're not primary well, there colors. There are no green people out there. Is that what you were saying? <laughs> no. no. I'm just that it just, it just, just the, the rainbow of people, of humanity. The rainbow. And actually, he's kind of right because... <laughs> They represent the Africa, the Americas, Asia, Europe, and Oceania. Oceania, but but that's Aquaman's territory. That's not. <laughs> <laughs> what color is Oceania? Is it blue? I don't think they necessarily correspond, but I see. Well, okay, learn something new every day. Uh, we're counting down the top ten things that made us go wow, and we've reached number seven. Number seven. One of the many things that was dampened and almost ruined, but made it through the previous administration uh, led by the twice impeached, disgraced uh, person whose name will go unmentioned, was that the Kennedy Center Honors, which I look forward to every year, they usually, usually air between Christmas and New Year's when I'm exceptionally nostalgic and sentimental. And the um, nominees for the 44th uh, Kennedy Center Honors were announced this week. And they include just amazing people, which just means I'm getting older because I know them all intimately. But Barry Gorder, Gordy, the founder of Motown, songwriter, producer. you know, That's going to be a hell of a tribute, don't you think? That's going to be really fun. Yes. Yeah. And then uh, another person in the, in the same kind of category, Lauren Michaels. The executive oh, producer of Saturday Night Live and so many things. So just when you think about those two men in this case, and there's some women nominated too, their contribution to the popular culture in the past 50 years is remarkable. And I can't wait to see who comes out to fet them old, new, and in between. And then two amazing female icons, Bette Midler. Oh. I can't believe hasn't been honored up to this point, but I can't gotta wait. Gotta have friends. And then the one, the only Joni Mitchell. Is being rewarded, being honored this year, and you know, it's Joni, hard to believe she hasn't been honored yet. You know, absolutely. and you know, I, I'm I'm not like a folk person, whatever. But you listen to Joni Mitchell's songs in the '60s and '70s, especially the '60s when she was so incredibly young, and like songs like Both Sides Now, and just the the are so profound. They just like if you want to talk about divine inspiration not taking away and you know i i believe that you know creativity come, like people are sort of like uh, you know units to sort of express themselves but joni is so incredibly talented and also there's always one classy you know uh, uh cultured person to class up the joint Oper operatic bass baritone justino diaz who i don't know anything about but i will find out 
uh, when this airs. And I'm and you know the thing is is that the the previously twice impeached disgraced uh, president did not chose not to attend just to remind us of the the, the divide in every aspect of life that he provided. But I'm sh I, I assume and I'm looking forward to uh, President and Mrs. Biden being there, Dr. Biden and uh, and uh, the Harrises as well. Hmm. I imagine that that the the former guy didn't go for two reasons. Number one, that his base would think he was being oh the fall 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 you know like that, and he, it wouldn't play well with his base. But also because he, uh, they told him that nobody would accept the award if he was there. I and remember Cher saying she she wouldn't go, and you know blah blah blah. Uh, also, uh, but probably because he wasn't getting the award, he would he would be like, <laughs> I'm the only there you go. go. <laughs> yeah, I um and the last thing you know, last year they did a very innovative uh kind of a COVID event where it was in several locations outside mass audiences. Who knows where we're headed between now and when they take these, but wouldn't it be great if we were back at the Kennedy Center and they were um, in the balcony and, and looking down. It's such a special night to see artists kind of just silenced and gobsmacked by people paying tribute to them and artists that, again, have enriched uh, America and the world so deeply anyway. It's actually, there isn't an award show like it, is there? Where you mm -hmm. would get the award, and instead of you having to say something or do, you just get to people sit loving back on and you. just have people yeah. love you. Yeah, it yeah. is. It's always a nice thing to see everyone just be sort of surprised by the people who come out. It's it, it yeah. is. It's a great show. It's a wonderful oh. show. I hope we do get back. Do get to have a classic episode, classic show, it. and that's in January. Is that right, Tom? It usually, again, last year they did it at a different time because of COVID, but it usually, oh. it, they tape it in the fall and it usually airs between Christmas and New Year. So I'm hoping that'll happen again, but I'll keep you posted. All, right. All right, let's go on to number six, James. Number six. Uh, cranky pants. This is what happens when you wake me up early in the morning. I'm just going to be James, cranky. It's not <laughs> early. Come on. I, I, it's three o'clock in the morning. I just, it feels like the sun isn't even up yet. I, I don't know what you people 5 do. 5 a.m. I was bright eyed and bushy tailed <laughs> off to the gym. Like, oh. My day is almost over. For Christ's sake. Um, anyway, I watched American Horror Stories, um, the Ryan Murphy new anthology series on Netflix. And I think you all know how I feel about Ryan Murphy. I have railed against him and yet you go back time and time again to the ryan murphy well what does that say? well it's it's only because it gives me something to pitch about i i hate watch it and i i sit there and i just make myself work myself into a frenzy over these things um these Did it are one-off stories one episode each i believe i don't know i couldn't get through the first i got through the first one and i got angry and, and threw something at my tv and stormed off so but that's what happened to your alarm clock right <laughs> <laughs> no what happened to my alarm clock was you people with Waking me up at this hour, and I threw it against the wall and destroyed it. But anyway, seven episodes. The Junior League, Ryan Murphy Junior League, it's not Sarah Paulson. It is uh, uh, Paris Jackson, Michael Jackson's daughter, who's just beautiful. She really is stunning. Um, Kaya Gerber, who is is pretty, but sort of a little vacant. I'm sorry, she doesn't have the acting chops. I'm just going to say it. I'm just going there. Uh, Matthew Bomer is in it. He he is sort of the connection between the two. Um, uh, Adrian Barbeau is there for the olds, for the, for the oldsters like us. Um, and, uh, let me see. Billy Ward is there. Kevin, um, Kevin, uh, Kevin, what's his name from Glee? The boy in the wheelchair in Glee. Kevin McHale. Kevin McHale. I'm sorry. Yes. Um, now the thing is, is the first episode and I spoil or spoiler. I'm going to tell you the whole thing. It's uh, a new family mo moves into the murder house from season one. Uh, they find the girl finds the latex suit and puts it on the rubber man suit. And then she's not getting along. She's not very popular at school. And the popular girls at school play a prank on her. And she invites them to the house and she puts on the, the latex suit and murders them all. At the end. <laughs> That's the level of storytelling here. It is like popular girls are mean to a new girl and she kills. I mean, it's like the most hackneyed thing. It's just like, really? That's that's where you go with your first episode. And usually with Ryan Murphy, the first episode is the best. And then it spins out of control. And it spins I into thought the it. whole idea of American Horror Story was to mash up all the horror tropes and regurgitate them. I thought that was the whole concept. It was like well, a sampling I mean, they're, they're orgy. Rehashing tropes. And then there, there's just like redo it. Doing the tropes and becoming the trope is what it is. You think you're you think you're reinventing the wheel, and actually you're just rolling it around with the money for old trope. 
Isn't the format different? So is there's they're self-contained now stories or how well, Blake, tell me if you watched it because um I couldn't get through I couldn't do the second episode. Is it the same characters each time or is it different characters? I actually haven't watched it yet either. I plan to, but I, from what I hear, it is self-contained episodes, kind of like the Twilight yeah. Zone or Tales from the Crypt. Yes, but but I have a feeling that the same actors are are, are in the in each episode doing. I would ones. I would think it's like the same actors in each episode. Yeah, yeah. and like I said, it's interest. It was interesting to me because I I was fascinated by Paris Jackson. Just just there, she has she has a star quality, and she's very luminous to watch in those big big blue eyes i mean she's just stunning so i did watch it for that but the the writing it just did well i hate to say this james but as a as a trusted reporter on the mile report we need to go back and watch a few more episodes <laughs> well and it, it was just we just got like what the next season of american horror story is gonna be did you say the poster well, I know that Macaulay's in it, and we are going to watch it because of that. Yeah, but it's about like sea monsters and aliens, which Why, yeah, because we, we have seen Macaulay coming out of the water crying. It was the big uh, oh. get is with all the pictures. So maybe he gets he's swimming and a sea monster gets some or something. Hmm. When is that coming? In my mind are the sea monkeys that used to be advertised <laughs> in the back of comic books. So maybe it's American Horror Story sea monkeys. <laughs> See now, if you were writing these, I think we might have a chance. I think it might be good. I'm seeing a drag race challenge, actually. The, the underwater sea monkeys. <laughs> drag race. Maybe, maybe instead of maybe um instead of drag race Holland, drag race Italia, blah blah. blah maybe it's drag race Oceana, and we go <laughs> under the sea and find the, the the people living in Atlantis and give them a season. Right. The the new Whoa. season starts August 25th. All right. Oh, so that back to back two seasons? Well, no, it, this is different. This is this okay. is uh, American Horror Stories, and then American Horror Story comes out in in September. And oh, then, well, I'm then, glad you explained that. I completely yeah. missed that. It's a tad bit confusing. There's an abundance. We All right, let's move on. Simple <laughs> Number five. Number five. I can't believe you haven't talked in my absence about Lil Nas X, Industry wow. Baby. Just oh the best. My. I mean, we are so lucky to be alive in the time of Lil Nas X. Do you I'm know just, what? Before you start, I just want to put that out there. No, I mean, that's it. That was really basically all I was going to say. I mean, <laughs> after Montero, you would feel like you're done. You don't have to do anything more. You've done all... But this Industry Baby video, have you seen it? Yeah, it's so good. Oh, my God. <laughs> But it's almost 39 million views. It is the gayest thing <laughs> I have seen in my life. I was clutching my pearls <laughs> from beginning to end. I, it's, it's just set on loop. I mean, it's... I, I actually I actually rendered speeches. I don't really know where to start with this because it's, it's just so good and outrageous. And takes on many tropes. Like, he's, he's definitely hitting the gay thing right in the middle. But it's also about jail, incarceration, black men. Well, fascinatingly, hold on. Um, the the thing is, is the day he released it, he also joint partnered with um Bail. He created something called Bail X, in which he was um, a, it's a charity that helps people uh achieve their bail, and it it targets you know uh African American communities, and and so he really is. He's putting, you know, he, he's he's doing these outrageous things, but he's also doing really good things, and he's moving the needle forward, culturally speaking. And he's just there. Everything he does, he seems to be doing. It's it's not just willy nilly being throwing things out there. He really he's got his eye on the prize, and the prize is total right. pop culture dominance. It's like fame isn't happening to him. He is like in control right he really it for for someone as young as he is yeah. I, I wonder who his who his handlers are and who who the people he surrounds himself with because it's sort of a gaga esque that he just he keeps getting the best people to surround himself the 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 well it, and no shade to gaga but i think gaga was so brilliant at throwing out incredible imagery but i think as you say there's a strategy it's almost like the marvel comic universe which i know james you hate but it's almost like there's a deliberation. There's a deliberate point between each thing. Him in the jumps, the the prison jumpsuit, but it's pink. 
with the white boxers slightly above. <laughs> it also reminds me, I'm an old white gay guy, but when Madonna used to sort of make her statements, which were very bold at the time for a woman, and she was so goddamn sexy doing it. And that's kind of also the other part, like he has a message and he's so goddamn sexy doing it. And, and it feels like it's a sexiness that isn't just, that knows no bounds. Like it's obviously- But there's a, just a joy in his sexuality that like in the, remember when he was kissing the um, the go-go dare, the backup dancer, and it's just these incremental thing boundaries that he's busting, that he's doing joyfully and gleefully. And the fact that it's getting the, the conservatives all up in arms and it's getting the old people all up in arms and he's, he's loving it. And it just, it, you can't help. I can't imagine anybody, uh, any young person not thinking that he is the coolest person on the planet, right. well, you know, straight, the, black, white, whatever, you know, I haven't really heard him speak much. You know, I've, I've read the clapbacks on Twitter, which all, each and every one is so good on Twitter. Yes. But but yes. I actually found in went down a bit of a sort of Google hole and found these there's two videos where he talks about the meaning of the lyrics of each of the songs. One of Montero and the other one is Industry Baby. And I've never really heard him speak before. And it was such a revelation. And he, everything you both you have both said about him is borne out in these two pieces. And we'll post a link on YouTube on, on the Wow Report because it's so great to hear him speak and explain the lyrics because, you know, you don't also hear all the lyrics, but in, in Industry Baby, he's like, I don't fuck bitches, I'm queer. And it's like, he's saying like, people get so upset and yet he's like, songs are about love and fucking all the time. Why can't we have songs about gay people fucking? Why can't we normalize it? And he's not defensive. He's just, he's just doing it. And to be doing it in a medium that is notoriously homophobic yeah. is... It's like a bonus. The whole thing is just, I am just, I am just in love with well, Lil someone Nas was X. saying on like, Twitter, someone, someone went to him on Twitter and said, you know, or someone said, I think this Lil Nas X thing, I think it's all, you know, industry, uh, you know, uh, it, 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 they're, they've been planning it and it's not real and he's probably not even gay. And, blah, blah. and he's like, nah, man, I just like dick. <laughs> like he just, <laughs> he like answered it. It was like, just no, it's, that it's just as simple as I like dick. <laughs> <laughs> and also, um, there, there was a great in. I didn't realize this. Montero, you remember Montero, the the first single. Um, he said one of the key lyrics is "Call me by your name." You know, "Call me by your name." Like, well, he explains, and I never made the connection. He watched the movie "Call Me by Your Name," and it was like the first gay movie he'd ever watched, and it sort of inspired him partly to write Montero. I was like, oh my god, Aww. you know. Well, anyway. Amazing, just amazing. Um, let's take a break. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, Blake, do you have a question? I do. They're all about Olympics this week. Um, I wanted to ask, I thought this was very interesting. How many times have the Olympics been canceled before and why? All right, we'll have the answer right after the break. You're listening to World of Wonders Wow Report. Things that make us go wow. Welcome back to the Wow Report. Fenton here with James and Tom and Blake with an Olympic question. Yes, I asked, how many times have the Olympics been canceled before and why? Well, I imagine once would be World War II. Tom, what would you say? I would say twice for World War II. Oh, uh, okay. And maybe like a World War One or something. But um, so I'm going to say three times, but I don't know what, what the third would be. I'm with three, too. Well, four. Did you forget the 2020 Olympics were postponed? Uh, 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 and actually, so it was in 1916 for World War One. Okay. 1940 and 44 for World War Two. Gotcha. And... One of the Olympics that was scheduled to, it was scheduled to be in Tokyo, the 1940 Olympics. Exactly. Yeah, I forgot. Okay. So the Tokyo Olympics have been canceled oh, twice. Twice. And then this time it's now, uh, I'm done. Going to well, this time they actually, last time it was canceled. This time it's. It's postponed. canceled, Miss Thing. <laughs> this time it we got to postponed. Uh -huh. I see. All right, let's carry on with our countdown number four. Number four. 
Earlier, I was gushing over Joni Mitchell, Bette Midler, Laura Michaels. I am now gushing over, you know, it, it's, it's harder as you become more mature to absorb pop culture music in a way that is joyous. There's an artist that I have found that I love, Olivia Rodrigo. Obsessed. Love her. Yes. I don't know what it is about her. You know, I, you know, in I have uh, you know Radio X, XM, X, you know Sirius XM, and I think channels like two, three, and four are like hit songs and divas and 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 uh, Soul Cycle, and I I purposely listen to them, force myself sometimes because I'm always listening for songs that could be good lip syncs on RuPaul's Drag Race. And they make very few new songs that are good lip sync songs because they're, you know, the, 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 right now it's very folky, very vibe, very Billy Eilish. And Olivia Rodrigo's first single license, uh, driver's license, which is so beautifully written, is really mellow. And then she had Deja Vu, which kind of had a beat. And then she did Good For You, which is this incredible. I don't know. Good For You. Good For You. It's just, it's all about how it, it's, 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 she kind of, she's very influential. She's 18 years old. Yeah, he got a record deal right before the pandemic hit, like the week before. It's like you got a record deal, and she spent all of quarantine writing songs, and she's and writing think- songs that are there are about her life and her boyfriend and the the breakup yeah. with her boyfriend, and it's very confessional, and it, it's that just makes it even better. And it's it's a little, um, it's very influenced by Taylor Swift, um, mm-hmm. and 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 yet, and Taylor, if you're listening, please call. Let's talk this through, but. Taylor Swift, I think, is an amazing artist in terms of creating pop, but I'm not in love with her voice or her, you know, like I don't get lost in Taylor Smith's vocals. I think she writes great pop songs and country songs and, you know, can I not deny her, but I just, for whatever reason, she's not gotten under my skin. Olivia Rodrigo has gotten under my skin and yet they're similar, but there's also, and I said this before the, like, I feel like there's some Joni Mitchell in Olivia Rodrigo. I know that's a sacrilege because Joni Mitchell is a god among men. But I just feel like there's something deeper going on or something smokier or more, I don't know, emotional. You definitely want to see where she's going with this career. And you definitely want to see her at age 30, at age 40, at yes. age 60, see what Olivia is is doing. You get that feeling that she's in it for the long run, unlike that one that you used to like, Benson. That that Megan Trainer girl who just came in a little quiet lately. That's true. <laughs> she had that one hit. I saw that she sold her house to like um like Kelly Clarkson or something for fifteen million. And I was like, how in the hell did Megan Trainer get a fifteen million dollar house? But that's <laughs> not her. Writes her songs because she writes other people's songs. She's a hit maker. She's a hit machine and an artist. Well, I, I definitely true. respect your choices, Tom, because I remember you were singing the praises of Ariana Grande very early and on. You never in let us forget it. And we were poo-pooing you, and you quite rightly got, you know, you told us I do want to say with Olivia Rodrigo, though, that that first time you hear with the the segue into the red light, green light, I still see your face. That and I always think of that Saturday Night Live skit where the where the the macho guys are sitting around talking about it, and they they're playing it, and they're they all start singing it, and their minds are blown when it goes into that part of the song, and they're all like, "Do you think that he really did drop write the song about her, and she really does drive past his house?" And like everyone is so involved in Olivia's life, and it all started because isn't she on uh, High School Musical, the musical of the series? Isn't that where this started? That's where she started. And she wrote a song for that that got really popular. And she thought, hey, I can do this. And her boyfriend really did. They used to drive around together in the car. And then now she, like, the, he dropped her for the other woman on the show, I think is what it happened. So good. It's the same with Billie Eilish, right? Her boyfriend, you know, didn't work out. That's in the documentary a lot. Oh, these Billie. guys who make Billie's these terrible over. mistakes. And- Wrap well, her up. Billy's over. It's a tough one. Don't wake things up too early in the morning. Billy and Megan, take a hike. We're going to move on to number three, James. Number three. And I'm just, I'm getting crankier and crankier as this goes on, because this one is going to descend into <laughs> madness and chaos. But I'm starting off. I had two trailers that I watched this, this week that really blew my mind that I really wanted to talk about. The first is something called Tatine. 
and it's a French movie that won the Palm d'Or at Cannes, and it's getting rave reviews, and it's being released in October, and the trailer dropped, and it's just absolutely bananas. It is very chic bananas, is what it is, and I'm going to read you this. The film centers around Alexa, played by Agatha Ruel, a female serial killer who is impregnated by a car who disguises her gender and goes incognito as a lonely fireman's long lost son. And it, that's how it starts. And it just goes more bananas from there. And by the end, when she's breastfeeding and the breast milk is oil because she had sex with the car uh, and gave birth to a car baby is the, and when you watch the, the trailer and it has, the zombies uh I, where does she go how does she know that song you know i would try to find her she's not there i want to tell you about the way she walks the way she and the color Santana. of her hair that song and it is the best use of 60s music you've ever seen in a trailer it is so good and the cinematography is fantastic the casting looks fantastic everything about this movie is just exciting and i i predict oscars all around the the, the woman impregnated by the car movie is going to win every oscar now the one yeah with this with this genre be auto erotica <laughs> <laughs> thank you tom this is why we have you on the show <laughs> carpe diem carpe diem <laughs> Um, the other one that I wanted to talk was the Respect trailer with Jay Hud, Jennifer Hudson as Aretha Franklin. And I am just going to say it. I think Jennifer Hudson is the worst actress in Hollywood. I think she is just terrible. I can't believe they gave her an Oscar for Dreamgirls. She destroyed the movie. How dare she think that she can do, and I am telling you, in a different key, just to differentiate it from, from Jennifer Holliday so that people will think that she's not copying it. But if she had copied Jennifer Holliday, then I might be giving her some props. But the fact that she thinks that she can go out there and destroy that song and then get an Oscar for it, I just, and I can't wait to see how she destroys Aretha Franklin's legacy because that's what's going to happen. You know, and she's going to go out there and try and Jennifer Hudson it up. James, I wish I could hug you. I wish I could, I wish, already calling angry with me about somebody this. Somebody needs a hug, and I wish I was there to give it to you. Can I just give you one thing to listen to after the broadcast today? Yes. Just to, to, to reacquaint you with – listen to Jennifer Hudson's single, Pocketbook. And tell me after – text me after you listen to it, Pocketbook. And tell me if that doesn't somehow redeem her or – Put her back into your graces. Well, do you do you think that she? I I know you're looking forward to it, Tom. I I know you are, and I know you probably like Jennifer Hudson too. So give me, tell me why. Other than pocketbook, why 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 should I not be worried? I haven't seen the trailer. I think Aretha was a very complex. Uh, uh, and does individual. can Jennifer Hudson do complexity? Because I saw her in Sex in the City too, and let me tell you, that girl cannot read a line to save her life. Wasn't she in Cats? Mm -hmm. Yes, she wasn't. She destroyed memory, like the song that like anybody can sing. She managed to destroy that too by putting it into a higher range. You cannot blame cats on Jennifer Hudson. <laughs> I will not allow it. Here, not on my watch. The whole movie down. It was going great until she showed up. <laughs> <laughs> to the very end. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's move on. Um, <laughs> number two. Number two. Hey, have you heard? Do you know Sparks? Yes, of course. Sparks. Yes. There is a documentary that is out called The Sparks Brothers, and it is by Edgar Wright, who is this amazing director. He's British, um, very avant garde. And in a little side note, we discovered him. We put him in Takeover TV in the early 90s, but he's gone on to much bigger and better things. And he directed Tintin. He was supposed to direct Ant-Man. He also directed this cult movie, Shaun of the Dead, which is yes. a great comedic zombie movie. Yes. He has made this documentary about Sparks. And Sparks were an anomaly when they came along in the 70s, a pop duo, sort of Pet Shop Boys-ish, I guess. And Sparks consists of two brothers, Ron and Russell. And the extraordinary thing about, about them is, is Ron kind of looks like Hitler and has a little Hitler mustache yes. and would appear on top of the pops and play the keyboards, but never sort of emote. And he'd look at the camera 
and like do these sort of strange looks. And it was very sort of performancy and weird. And then his brother Russell was the singer and he was a heartthrob. He had lovely tresses. Sort of like Captain um, and uh, he was the, He was the captain of, of the Captain and There Tineo. you go, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, I think, you know, you could look, you could see elements of the Pet Shop Boys in them, craft work, Roxy music, the residents. And they've just made a whole life. They sort of are like huge. they're, they're um, uh, pop stars look to them as pop stars is what That's I always right. sort of get exactly. the feeling. Everybody yeah, looks, you know, if you're in the know, you know that Sparks are the coolest. Right. And then they had this other great hit, uh, Kimono My House. They also had uh, the number one song in heaven, which is one of my favorite all times, produced by Giorgio Moroda, you know, the disco mm -hmm. producer. Um, and this is an amazing documentary all about them. You'd never, I mean, you'd never think to make a documentary about Sparks because they're just not that well known. But Edgar Wright has got something like 65 interviews in this. Mike Myers, Beck, Weird Al Yonkovich, Todd Rundgren, Duran Duran, Flea, Patton Oswald, Neil Gaiman, Sonic Youth. Uh, it's just Bjork, Harvey Feinstein, Nick Hayward. I mean, it's this like extraordinary- oh, Nick Hayward, how does Nick Hayward look now? He looks good, James. He's oh, still doing it. That's good to hear. I do remember that Stephen Sabin was was very good friends with Sparks because they oh, would really? come to the New York club. They would be go to Area and dance at. I think they played dance at a number of times, and um, uh, so Stephen knew them really well and would see them often and have lunch with them out here in L.A. Oh, you're kidding! Oh my God! Because yeah. everybody thought for the longest time one that they're gay, they're not. Two that they were British because they were like they spent a long time in the U.K. and that's where they're. That sort of slightly quirky sound found a, a welcome audience, um, but actually they they grew up in LA. They grew yeah, up and lived yeah. in LA. In fact, yeah. um, you, they often hang out at a. There's a coffee shop. What the one hangs out at a coffee shop? Or what is the place that had the submarine that was Steve, the Steven Spielberg re, subway restaurant or something? The 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 mall. Oh, is that in Century City? In Century the Century City Mall. Oh, yeah, I'm they, gonna they, go there right often, now. You can often spot them at the Century City Mall outside. I'm gonna go there. I'm gonna go there right now. Sparks. It's available on demand. Um, really, check it out. It's it's really amazing. Um, let's take a break, and when we come back, we'll reveal the number one thing that make us go wow. You're listening to World of Wonders Wow Report. Things that make us go wow. Welcome back to the Wow Report. I'm Fenton here with James and Tom and Blake, and we have reached number one. What is the number one thing this week that made us go wow? Number one. It says here the Olympics. I find, in the past, I have found the Olympics kind of dull. I used to watch a lot with my family. This sounds weird. This is my twisted vision of the world, but they always felt a little heterosexual, heteronormative. And I have to say, that feels like it's changing. We live in a world where athletes can come out and proudly be who they want to be. And I will say this and shut up because I've watched very little. The only thing I've seen is the clip of t beautiful Tom oh. Daly oh. In his, with his beautiful body, his teeny tiny little speedo, and his partner, <laughs> whose name I don't know, forgive me, who has a uh, beautiful body and a little teeny tiny matching speedo. Uh -huh. and I they're synchronized. I didn't even know it was a. I didn't know it was a sport. The, the way know. they synchronize is just. It is. It is a thing of beauty. It is like supernatural. It is preternatural to watch them. And they run down the platform and they identically. They breathe identically. 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 Their hair bounces identically, and then they do an identical dive into the water. It's I so watched, wonderful to watch. I clicked on it for the little teeny tiny speedo, and before they hit, as they hit the water, I was crying literally because yeah. uh -huh. it is such. A I can't explain what it was. It's it's the most beautiful, one of the most beautiful things I've ever witnessed as a human being. If you think lip syncing is hard, you should see sync diving, right? Yes. Like and I don't know if you saw the picture of him in the mask with the tears rolling down his eye. I cried when I saw that. I love it. Well, 
Yes, he, and in his he's, he's, he's a wonderful person. He really is. He's married to Dustin Lance Black, who we know at World of Wonder, and they have a child. And he's only twenty five years old. This is his fourth Olympics, I think he said. Um, and, and his first gold, I think. And his first gold. And I don't know if you know this, but he's a a, a knitter and a crocheter, and he knit a little um Union Jack flag to put his gold thing in, and it's so cute. And I don't know if um if you've met him, Fenton or Tom, but he's been um. He's he hangs around Hollywood a lot and he's good friends with a world uh, with a drag race uh, superstar. And so I've met him uh, right in front of the World of Wonder building. He has taken pictures in front of the World of Wonder building and I've met him before and he's really great. He is lovely and sweet. You know, he knitted those little pouches that night. So you win so the good. gold, you go back to your room and you knit a pouch for it. And on one side is the America, the British flag. And on the other side is the Japanese flag. I was like, that may be great. But let's not forget the headline when he, his little acceptance speech, yeah. he spoke directly to LGBTQ audience and said, and he you said, know, I'm, I'm an Olympic winner and I'm gay yeah. and I'm proud yeah. and oh. God bless him. And the other thing, the other big takeaway, because before we have to go, is the Simone Biles thing where God bless this girl and God, I hope, I, I want nothing but the best for her and I want her to be just wrapped up and loved forever and ever and ever because the hate that she is getting and the love that she's getting seems like disproportionate because it, I don't know if you saw Pierce Morgan today. Uh, Pierce, just the, what? Pierce, don't even get me started on Pierce Morgan. You know, you know, what, you know what Pierce Morgan's uh, pronouns are? Was, were. <laughs> uh, but he said you know he said uh nobody should quit their job just because they aren't having fun and then he got ratioed for that because remember he walked off his show exactly. because he, you know like pierce what really that's your take on this pierce morgan but you know that she has had, she's gone through more than anybody should ever go through with the you know the scandal with her with her coach and the sexual abuse and she said that she just wasn't there she couldn't give it her all and she couldn't do it and so she you know i just i just feel for this girl and i, I love feel her. her tremendously because yeah. you know if if any it's she just, is she is gonna ramp best. up even more hatred and attacks i mean it's so unconscionable but that's you know, but they, she, and and to have the Republicans vote against America, like it's just all. I mean, there's so much we can get into here. But Tom, um, the other thing that's that's always been gay as fuck with the Olympics are the gymnasts, the male gymnasts. And if you ever get a chance, if you just if you're bored, go back and YouTube some of those boys because they are just beautiful. And watching them spin around on those bar you know, on even bars, I'm definitely oh. consuming it in clips. I'm not I'm I'm not you know watching it or, or rewatching it. Well, I will, I will end with this bumper sticker or sound like a bumper sticker, but live and let live people yeah. live and let live. You know, it's like you do it your way. Let her do it her way. Stop. Um, I can't end on that note. I have to reference to you. Peter the Tongan. Oh, oh. <laughs> I mean, come on. He came oh. out again for the second time. He's so Oil wonderful. Tulsa. Oilier, oily, oily, oilier than ever. More oily. And even with wearing a mask, you could hit. It, it did not bar his. It did, his beauty shone through. He is just the best of the best of Tonga. It makes me want to get on a boat and head to Tonga. Well, don't go to Tonga, James, because he actually lives in Brisbane, Australia. Because I looked it up for you. So, oh. um, well. <laughs> And I'm sure Tongan, I, I Tongo have a and Tongan men are all beautiful. I, th I, I, I'm just going there. So <laughs> I, I think I'm going to retire to Tonga and find my own little PETA. <laughs> Thanks for tuning into the wow report on radio. Andy, I'm afraid that's all we have time for this week. You can listen to previous episodes on our YouTube channel. Wow presents um, until then same time, same place next week. Yay, until then go out and do something that makes the world go. Wow. wow.